Welcome, welcome. We are back for another edition of The Lock-In. I am delighted to be welcomed by my co-host, Dara O'Kearney. Welcome, Dara. Well, uh, thank you very much, David. Delighted to be here. Um, this is my second appearance on a webcam this week. I did actually brush my hair for this one, so it doesn't look <laughs> like horrendous as the, as the BBC Radio Ulster one. Yeah, I'm glad you're making more of an effort for us than you are for BBC Radio Ulster. That's great. Um, we are joined today by one of the most dapper young men in all of British poker. So we did have to make a bit of an effort, I guess, Dara. He recently notched up his biggest result, making a deal four ways, and then immediately coming forth for, I want to say, 250K, but it might have even been more than that in the $5 million blowout event. He is the handsome, talented, and aptly named, or so I'm told, Jack Hardcastle. Jack, welcome. Thank you for a very grandiose introduction. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was 270, but let's not, all right, all let's right, not bother all about right, the details Jesus. that much. Well, look, we are going to get into a few topics this week. We're actually struggling for topics. I remember, Jack, when we asked you during the week, uh, were there any topics we, you could bring up yourself? Because it was a bit of a slow news week and you were ready to fire off a lot of shots at the UK poker community. <laughs> I'm glad something big happened and we can maybe at least dilute all the shots you're going to fire and the ways in which you were going to put this show in legal jeopardy. Um I, I think you probably talk. like <laughs> thought it was going to be way worse than it actually is. No, it's just like a couple of things. No, We're still going to give you a chance. Obviously, we love <laughs> a bit of controversy. It'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, last Tuesday, Sheldon Adelson died tragically at the age of 87. Tragically, of course, in the sense that he lived way, way, way too long. Um, Adelson purchased the Sands Hotel Casino back in the 1980s. Bit of a Vegas legend, I guess, in some sense. He opened the Venetian um, on the same lot, actually, as the Sands in 1999, in 2004, he put it all public and ended up with a ridiculous fortune, something in the region of $35 billion. Adelson was a huge donator to the Republican Party, helping to fund several high-profile Republican campaigns uh, over the last 20 years or so. The re-election campaign of George Bush, the Mitt Romney failed presidential bid in 2012, and of course, a lot of money he pumped into the 2018 midterms and the 2020 Trump campaign. Um, he also put money into lots of other senators and whatnot and is basically the biggest donator to the Republican Party, or at least was. So they are going to miss him for sure. In poker terms, Adelson was sort of a thorn in the side of the poker community, uh, it's fair to say. He financially backed the coalition to stop internet gambling in 2014, a move pretty consistent with his general efforts to thwart companies um, offering internet gambling in the US. Daryl, what were your first reactions when you heard this news? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to dance on anybody's grave or anything. Obviously, <sighs> Why not? For, all, for all the reasons you gave, he, uh, he, 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 he was definitely a negative force on online poker in particular, which I mean, I guess is probably our main interest in him. He, it's also fair to say that on on the political spectrum, he would have been more or less the polar opposite to what certainly I am and probably you are as well. So he's not somebody we would have had natural sympathy for. Um, I mean, that said, he obviously had a very, very successful life. He rose from poverty uh, to the absolute fortune that he amassed. I believe he also, he while he was the biggest donor uh, on the Republican side to campaigns like the Bush, or sorry, the Trump campaign and also Trump's inauguration, I think he also donated to some Democrats. I could be wrong on that. You might you might correct me on that. Um, but but yeah, I mean, obviously, online poker play, players don't like him, and there and, and there was a long-standing kind of half-assed boycott of the Venetian um, because he owned it. Um, what his death actually means. I don't know because I presume the same forces that don't like online gambling uh, for, for for either moral or business reasons in the States are going to continue even without him. So I don't really see any major change on that front. Um, but yeah, definitely not a very popular man with the online poker community. Yeah, I'm not going to correct you at all, Dara. In fact, Adelson was actually a Democrat very early on in his life and did contribute early on to some Democrats and I think continued to give some of the maybe more conservative Democrats, some of the sort of middle middle ground people uh, some money uh, as well. But yeah, mainly most of that money going to the Republicans. There was some nice things said on Twitter, so I want to be somewhat balanced about this. Sean McCormick. Uh, said, working in poker, I all too well know the hurdles Sheldon Adelson created for US online poker. Although our ideologies did not align in debt, we cease arguments and pay tribute to him. Sands Corporation has employed so many people here in Las Vegas. Our city remains grateful. Rest in peace. And I suppose it's fair to point out that when 
COVID began, Adelson did uh, continue to pay all his employees for, I think, at least two months in wages, which is obviously a decent thing to do. Um, not maybe above and beyond what you would expect, but maybe in the sort of setup America has for these kind of things and the, and the lack of uh, sort of corporate responsibility, I suppose the fact that someone was voluntarily doing that is a very good thing. Um, it's also fair to say that our good pal, Robbie Straczynski, who maybe came after me a little when I was a little nasty, um, he did a Facebook post of his own in that he says, it is possible to disagree vehemently with an individual's positions while not hating the individual themselves and to see past those disagreements to the person's virtues. Sadly, an overwhelming majority of people in my industry who oppose Mr. Adelson are reacting in some of the most disgusting ways possible to his passing. I, I, I felt I felt uh, seen. I felt seen there. Um, <laughs> I want to bring you in here, Jack. Uh, I know you shared a very funny comment by a good friend of ours, friend of the show too, um, who uh, who had a strong opinion, it's fair to say, on Mr. Adelson. Yeah, I'll just find it quickly. It was very funny. Uh, he said he was a horrible old bastard who I hate even more for the fact that I love his poker room so much. And it is a nice poker room. I'll give him that. <laughs> mm, yeah, <I> was <laughs> who was that? Out, that? out that man. Out that man. David Doherty. <laughs> <laughs> Fair play, Dave. That was a great line. Yeah, look, there was a lot of uh, hate on the internet for this man uh, dancing on his grave, as Dara put it. Uh, of course, our great pal, Luke Vrabel, Slaybides, said, hit the showers, Uncle Shells. So we got a little, uh, you know, proper shower from uh, from the shower man there. And uh, yeah, look, I, I, I certainly didn't uh, hold back either. So there were some, um, yeah, less than favourable comments about both his political positions, uh, and, and other stuff as well. Something I noted as well in, in the mainstream press, NBC um, newsman or more more kind of uh, opinion man, uh, Mehdi Hassan said, if you're writing obituaries on multi-billionaire Trump GOP donor Sheldon Adelson, please don't airbrush out his long history of anti-Arab racism, his funding of the Islamophobia industry or his support for nuking Iran. So, you know, I can understand how there's a lot of political stuff which certainly would have uh, polarized opinion on him, but he, he he certainly made his mark on poker in in a weird kind of way. He's probably been one of the most influential people in the landscape of poker in the last 10 years, because no doubt without him, it would have been certainly a lot more possible that online poker could have survived in the US. Who knows? You never know about that. Maybe, as you said, Dara, other people would have replaced him, but he was a, uh, a, a pivotal figure, certainly. Jack, I want to get you in on our next topic here, seriously, because uh, Chris Moneymaker has left Poker Stars, possibly the longest serving ambassador on any poker site ever, I want to hazard a guess. 17 years he did uh, with Poker Stars. He was a major part of all their marketing efforts going back to when he won the WSOP in 2003. I think they signed him right after that. He, of course, won an $86 satellite on their site, which got him into the tournament. So I guess it was a natural way for them to get the benefit of that. And of course, they had planned this moneymaker tour around him, which I assume was going for a second season. So they're probably going to have to change the way they're doing things. Now, what did you make of Chris Moneymaker as a young poker player from the UK? Obviously, the moneymaker boom is something that you maybe didn't directly benefit from. You came to poker a bit later, but he's still a very famous figure. Yeah, I mean, I've watched a bunch of his hands uh, on YouTube, but I wasn't around or playing or watching even when the, the boom actually happened because I was seven so it's uh, <laughs> obviously i know his influence within poker uh, to be honest i was surprised that he's even there that long like considering the exodus of every other world series champ or everyone else that they'd signed throughout the years i thought it was quite shocking that he actually made it to 2021 that's an interesting point dara how would you view maybe the reasons that poker stars kept him about so long obviously the famous name must be part of it but there's got to be more the last name <laughs> it's got to be that if he was like <laughs> Chris yeah. Smith, he's gone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's credited with kick starting the whole online poker boom. It was kind of the perfect storm, the fact that he satellited into the main event online, <clears throat> um, not actually intending to, um, didn't realize he'd entered a satellite. Um, and then he goes and wins it, and that name, obviously. Um, he So that was massive for poker stars at the time um so there were historical reasons why he he he, he was seen as a as a huge figure um that said i mean you have to wonder how much um relevance it has in today's world 
the other thing I would say is that, like, I personally don't buy into the whole idea that he single-handedly started the online poker boom. I, I kind of think that was going to happen anyway. He, 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 it's it's kind of the uh, the great man view of history to look at that one event kickstarted something, but I think it was coming anyway. And uh, if it hadn't been that, it would have been something else. But he he obviously because of the perfect name and the fact he won the main event, having satellite it in, he was sort of the perfect person to push online poker, um, certainly in the early days. Um, I think a lot of us felt, and I certainly felt that he was probably there for life because of that. Um, but, you know, there's no real sentiment for um, in poker. But having said that, I do believe it was his decision to leave rather than the other way around. Um, and I don't know if we're allowed to say who, we believe he's going to, but there are very strong rumors that he's or he, he's going to another site. So um, yeah, it, it was certainly a surprise, and I think it probably caught stars on the hop slightly as well. As you said, they had they did base a lot of their marketing around Chris as sort of the, the grassroots figure. Still, um, they had this grassroots tour, very low buy-in, where Chris was was going around and playing all the events. So from that. F- point of view um it's 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 a hit to their marketing but um you know stars are a very resilient company i'm sure they'll they'll find some way to rebrand that yeah i think you're absolutely right dara it, it has been maybe a pattern we've seen over the last few years that stars have been getting rid of certainly the non-content creating ambassadors that were in their roster you've seen that kind of consistently over the last three years it's fair to say they shit can Negrano, even though they at least gave him the ability to spin it as his decision, but that was absolutely not his decision. And then with this one, of course, you could view it the same way, although I have to say exactly the rumours you've heard, Dara. I've spoken to a few people, both kind of industry people, people who have good stars connections, and they're absolutely adamant that it was Chris's decision. And in fact, they're fairly confident that another site, namely ACR, has already approached him and is maybe considering backing up the truck for that uh, big signing. I guess American facing site like that, they are keen to get someone of Chris's stature, maybe to build their whole live poker brand around if they do decide on some kind of live product, but certainly as an online name for a site where American people can play online, he, he's a great name for them. Yeah, I, I believe Chris has gone on another podcast and ha- has already indicated that the reason for his leaving was he just didn't want to travel as much anymore. I guess the the um, turning up in Manchester or wherever for a one one six five <laughs> it wasn't is, isn't that appealing when you live in uh, Tennessee or wherever this Chris lives? So presumably, it, 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 if he does sign with a more American face inside like America's card room, then you know the travel will at least be more amenable to him, and uh, he, he won't have to do it as much. It it kind of makes sense the stage that Chris is at in his life. You know, entering into middle age now, um, you really don't want to be traveling or around as much as when you're younger. Yeah, and I gotta say, very likable man, great ambassador of the game, great Hall of Fame inductee, and uh, yeah, we wish him well. Whatever uh, it comes next, he obviously came on the show last year. We did a Chip Race interview with him, a lovely interview, in fact. He he was very open about all the different stuff that was going on at the time. Jack, what do you look for in a poker ambassador these days? Obviously, you've sort of come into poker in a completely different paradigm to Dar or I. Yeah, well. I mean, everything has to be on Twitch or YouTube or, you know, something like that these days. There's no poker pros that I can think of, really, that are just sponsored just to play exclusively. Not on Stars, at least. Um, I don't know. I, I find the idea of, like, people streaming 20 ABI and then getting sponsored by Stars a little bit funny. But there are also some really good streamers as well. So I, I think it's just a matter of how good you are at that job. So you think it's just, it, it must be a sort of a sing for your supper kind of thing. There, it's no longer the case that someone could be just a big enough name that you could just slap a patch on them, make, an, make them a walking billboard and that's good enough? Yeah, I, I don't really think the market's there for it anymore. I think it's just shifted that much. Interesting. And when you consume poker content these days, obviously I, I'm guessing you're consuming a lot of educational stuff, a lot of training course stuff and, and the like. But when it comes to entertainment, what, what are you looking for there? Um, I watch Lex quite a lot still. Like I'm also like friendly with Lex, so that's probably why as well. But um, yeah, I think Lex is very good at what he does, and he obviously draws in massive numbers. You're literally friends with Ian Simpson. Come on, Jesus, give him something. Yeah, I, I forgot. He <laughs> yeah. And this is a Unibet show. I mean, that was the <laughs> softest of softballs ever. But he just goes straight for Lex. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know, mate. I don't want to watch 25 euro comps on Univert. You know, let's get some high stakes. Oh, shots fired. Okay, we have to cut that out now. And we, no, hang on. It's, I'm, I'm just getting, we actually have to end the interview there. I'm sorry, Jack. It's been lovely having you on, but we've been decided the, the Univert people are in my now. They're saying, get rid of them. Get rid of them now. Yeah, uh, no, it's while it lasted. <laughs> You were so close. I, I felt like you were next in line for a Unibet deal and then it's just, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah, I mean, I feel that the fact that I'm not sponsored is honestly a disgrace, but... <laughs> yeah, we're hot takes like that, you know, uh, at, you know, one of, the, one of the big poker sites. You know, well, you know, yeah, absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. <laughs> the problem is I know that if I got sponsored by anyone, I'd be out the door in about three months because I'll just say something. What a three months it might be, though, Jack. Oh, we enjoyed <laughs> yeah, that three yeah. months. We could create so much content around his three months at Unibet, couldn't we, Dara? Absolutely, yeah. Jack would be the ideal star of um, uh, life on the road with Jack. <laughs> I feel like the vlogs would get a bit out of hand if that was my job. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, look, another thing, and you sort of alluded to it a moment ago, that I know you have strong opinions on, Jack, are poker coaches. Um, the poker coaching market in general, maybe maybe specifically the kind of coaches that offer their services in the UK is maybe somebody who is a, a more familiar with that. Give me your take on, you know, what people should be looking for from a coach. Uh, they should be looking for someone who can articulate their thoughts. I think in 2021, you need to be able to use a solver and show reasons why. Because uh, that's the reason I actually haven't started because I haven't got a proper setup because I want to do some coaching, but that's just not in place yet. Um, I think it's also very important that they've won on the big sites in the last few years because the game in 2015 is so different to now. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair take. Dara, obviously, you do a lot of coaching. You've been coaching for years. You coach a mixture of recreational players and some top pros as well, and people in between. Well, when you're kind of putting your coaching, say, schedule together over a week or a month, is it the high-class players who are really going to test you out and maybe make you push your own limits? Are the more interesting sessions? Or do you actually get a lot from the more recreational stuff as well? No, I definitely get a lot from the, the recreation stuff too, uh, as, as well, because um, like with them, the challenge is to sort of take something from the solvers and explain it, explain, uh, explain the why. And often the process of doing that, uh, something clicks in my own mind. Um, with, the, with, with, with the higher performing players, and I mean, there are some guys that, that I coach now that I almost feel like I'm not really qualified to coach anymore, but uh, it's kind of similar, um, but they will... They will come back, I guess. With they'll, they'll have more pushback, um, so it's really important then to have done the the solver work and to understand the solver work. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, my coaching. I said this on my most recent blog. I like back in the pre-solver days. I actually didn't feel like I was really qualified to coach because, um, you know, you you probably remember David when we did uh, coaching sessions with the guys that we all staked. Um, I believe my answer was, uh, or my nickname was player dependent because that was my nickname. Hood, hood was, dependent, as I recall. Hood dependent as well, yeah. <laughs> because uh, I, I didn't have very clear cut uh, ideas on a lot of spots. It, for me, it was always very, very much fell independent, what the HUD was telling me. Um, and that was quite difficult to communicate a lot of the times. Once the solvers arrived, and I, and I, 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 and I, I was certainly one of the early adapters, um, the, the, the game kind of changed for me. And now I felt much more confident because I could. If I had an idea of what the right thing was, it, that didn't really matter. I could test it in a solver and then the solver would either confirm that I was right in my opinion or it would give me a different output and then I'd have to interpret that. So I think one of my strengths has always been explaining the output of solvers um, rather than just necessarily uh, running the solves or having good intuition in certain spots. Um, so I think the solvers have helped me a lot as a coach. Um, I am surprised that there's still a lot of coaches out there who don't seem to use solvers. That's just nonsense to me. I've listened to some hand history breakdown podcasts, for example, where as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking, this just doesn't sound right to me. And then I'll test it in a solver and I can prove that it's not right. And I'm thinking like, why did the, why did the content creator not do this himself? Why, did, why was he willing to put out something that could very well be wrong and did it actually turn out to be wrong? Yeah, it's such an important baseline, I think, these days when putting out content of that nature. Of course, it's absolutely fair to move away from the solver, you know, to look for exploitative reasons or whatever. But it, it still has to be there, a voice in the room, I think. It's just too important. Yeah, it's another thing I'd like to say is that, like, on the whole exploit versus solver thing, like, that's, that, for me, that's a bit of a false um 
distinction anyway, because with solvers, you can, you know, you, you can node lock, you can change ranges in HRC, you can say, well, this is actually the range the guy's shoving, so now should what I call, and the solver will come back with a different solution. So if you, even if you're an exploitative player, the sol solvers are still the best tool you can have based on, you can say based on, these are my assumptions about what the population is doing. Now, what should my strategy be? And the solver will solve perfectly for that rather than GTO. Great point. Jack, uh, listening to what Dara is saying there, would that instill you with confidence looking to him as a coach? Yeah. I mean, I basically send Dara all the hands that I want solved anyway. So, uh, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, and he does it free of charge. Be... <laughs> oh, you've got a good scam going. Yeah, it's going well. Yeah. No, I think it used <laughs> to be the case as well that your your results were what allowed you to charge certain rates to coach. Like it wasn't like exactly your knowledge. Now you can actually prove that you know this stuff just with solver knowledge. Before it's have you binked off these three scores and then I'll charge you 400 an hour. Hmm, interesting. I want to sort of put the shoe on the other foot there. Um, maybe Daryl, I'll get you to start this one as well. Um, have you ever been coached yourself? And if the answer is no, and I think the answer might be no, or at least no in the sort of more longer term, um, what do you look for in coaching type content, which I, I assume therefore means content that's out there that you can then consume? Yeah, so when I started out when I was about 18, 18, yeah, uh, not 17, I was uh, getting coached from Ryan LaPlante. So he's a good friend of mine now. We're still in contact. Um, but yeah, he basically brought me all the way through the, the micro stakes. I had like a couple of K after dropping out of uni. And then, uh, yeah, I went on the spin with it for the first few months of that year and then managed to make it a full time thing. Um, currently, I don't even really watch too many videos or anything like that. I watch the uh, final table reviews that are on YouTube where all the howl cards are exposed. Uh, but mostly I just chat with friends who are all like of a very good ability. Yeah, it's so important to, to lean into the, those friend groups and those hive minds as a resource. I'm far too polite to point out that I did put the question to Dara first, but that's okay. Uh, Jack, Jack likes to take the lead. That's fine. We understand. <laughs> uh, Jack, Jack, Jack's answer is pro probably more interesting. Yeah, I've never really actually been kind of coached. I mean, obviously when I was learning, um, uh, my brother initially taught me sort of a basic strategy and um i think i learned a bit from books not probably not too much this is all pre-training video on solvers obviously so the, the ways you could learn were kind of limited um i did get a decent amount of uh strategic input from rob taylor in the early days as well um but not exactly a formal coaching arrangement um in terms of content i'm looking for i i i basically want it to be tested um like if 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 I lo if I'm listening to strategic content, I want to know that the guys have actually tested it rather than they're just giving their opinion on the spot. Um, uh, I, I don't actually listen to too many hand history breakdowns anymore. Um, they're I think they're more entertainment than anything else. Um, I do watch a lot of training videos on Run It Once. I love Dan and Dvoris's videos in particular. Um, Sam Greenwood, uh, all those guys are really good, um, but. Probably the main way I learn these days is through my own study, running my own solves, and also using DTO, um, Dominic's uh, tool. Um, I don't just use that uh, sort of to drill myself in certain spots, but if I, if 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 I have a spot in DTO where the answer is not what I expect, then I'll go off and I'll actually run the solve myself, and I'll try and get an intuitive sense of why I was wrong and why the solution is the way that it is. <clears throat> So I think, I think those types of tools where you can sort of drill the same spots over and over again, 18 big blinds button versus big blind or whatever, and get really, really good in those spots. Um, I, I think they're probably the most effective tools right now. And even the recreational players that I coach actually enjoy the tool a lot because they say it's, it makes it like a game basically. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I have to say uh, since becoming a, um, uh, a purchaser of the of the DTO app I've used it most days I've got to be honest and what I love about it is actually most days I don't have a lot of time it might be a 20 minute coffee break it might be you know maybe for half an hour before playing it might be these little small chunks of time which people maybe feel like they can't do anything with that amount of time when it comes to poker because poker is too sort of immersive and involved actually the beauty of DTO as you say is you can just you know lash through 10 hands quickly and they're all the same type of spot and they really do provide you with these nice signposts that then sort of, you know, I think maybe by osmosis, get into your mind as these kind of guiding North Stars when you get into the, the actual hands themselves on, on the tables. Do you use that app, Jack? 
I've never actually used ETO, much to the horror of probably every reg in the pool right now. But <laughs> no, I, I I don't know. I I do look a lot of. I'd describe it as second hand solving, basically. <laughs> I just fire off a load of hands to friends or like um, Dan, who I I stake in tournaments now. He's always running sims on the side, so I get to have that info at least. You're reminding me of the way Fedor used to describe his process. He just had brilliant people around him, and he was the best at taking, snatching bits from everyone. <laughs> Oh, that's a nice comparison. I don't think I'm anywhere near as good as that. But <laughs> yeah, well, well, you made an interesting point there, there about the sort of ten to twenty minutes thing too. To I, I think that's being seen in other areas as well. I think one of the problems with the traditional training videos is they're often too long. Um, like who, who who's actually going to sit down and watch an, an entire one hour video in one go? Um, it's interesting when you look at some of the newer training sites. Um, Jack mentioned Ryan Laplante earlier. Um, on Ryan's side, Learn Pro Poker the um, the videos are all a lot shorter. Uh, they're typically six to 10 minutes. And I, I actually think that's a very good idea. Just take one concept and explain it in a video. And then it's much easier to get recreational players in particular uh, to, 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 to consume that content rather than you know a two hour hand history review or whatever. Yeah, that's good advice. Okay, I do want to move on. Um, we have another story. We've actually got a few news stories. I'm not sure how weighty our opinions can be on this. It's all a bit industry stuff, but I, I do want to mention them. The first one is MGM Resorts have put an offer in to buy Party Poker, I suppose, effectively for 8.1 million. Uh, sorry, 8.1 billion. Yeah, so it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be yeah, downgrading the value of that monster site. Since the US Supreme Court legalised sports betting in 2018, there has been a flurry of British gambling companies looking to synergize or join forces with these American casino operators. Of course, we saw Caesars by William Hill. We saw Flutter very recently increased its stake in FanDuel. I think they have like 90, 95% of FanDuel now. So basically a huge controlling share there. And now, of course, we have MGM putting in this move for, it's called Entain PLC, maybe better known to most as GVC Holdings. I think it was GVC until quite recently. An 8.8 .8 billion bid. Entain, of course, is the owner of the Ladbrokes Coral and Party Poker sites. So that's probably maybe on the street. That's what they're known as. Um, they uh, had their share price skyrocket uh, with the news of this potential deal. It's often the case that when these things go public, the share price rises. If the merger goes through, Entain would become 41.5% of the enlarged company. Um, there is talk, though, that Entain are playing hardball and want more per share if they do go through with this merger. Dara, I'm interested because we had a chat, I want to say, like maybe five or six shows ago or maybe three or four shows ago. I can't really remember when precisely about this notion of the big mergers. We were talking then, of course, about the Flutter deal. Um, and I'm just interested, like we are seeing this sort of um, cross pond stranglehold of the industry now by like three or four very big players. And that looks like it's going to be the landscape going forward. What does that mean for poker, which for a lot of these companies is actually quite a small percentage of it? Yeah, I think the last the last point there is kind of the crucial thing. My, my views haven't really moved on or in, in my information on the matter it haven't moved on even since the since the Flutter merger. It's it's. It's very similar. I mean, I have a lot of experience in the IT industry and other niche industries um, before I came into poker. And I saw a lot of these mergers. And a lot of the time, there was sort of false expectation that mergers are always good. But actually, what usually happens in mergers is more people lose their job than actually increased business. You find that two people are doing the same job on both sides and one of them has to go. Also, the fact that poker is such a small part, it's its kind of unlikely that the two companies would merge together and suddenly decide, oh, we're, we're, we're going to make poker a bigger part of our overall business. Um, the more likely result is that poker will, will will get diluted. Since I moved into poker also, this has been sort of borne out by that. Um, Unibet is actually my third sponsorship deal. My second sponsorship deal was with um, a, a site called Irish Eyes. They were in a, a, a skin on the old Interaction Network. And I remember about a year before the end of that, um, a, a large Chinese uh, company took over Interaction and everybody was going like, oh, this is huge for Interaction. Uh, they're going to get into the China market. They're going to be a major player now on the online poker thing. And all, and all that happened was six months in, the, 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 the new Chinese company decided to shut Interaction because it wasn't, it, it wasn't a priority. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's going to happen with Party. Obviously, Party are a, are, are, are a big player. What I would say is, you know, there's, there's three likely outcomes. 
the first possible outcome, and by far the least likely in my view, is that they'll decide to put more resources into into poker and make a party bigger. Um, the, 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 the the second least likely option, let's say, is they decide to downgrade it. Um, um, more than likely, it'll just have very little effect. They'll just continue doing what they did before, which is essentially what also happened in the Flutter merger. Uh, neither neither Betfair nor Paddy put any more effort into um, their own poker offerings. True, but is it maybe fair to say, and, and, and this might be something you could weigh in on, Jack, as well, poker stars certainly seem to be playing a different game when it comes to uh, marketing. There's been overlays this year. That's something that was almost unheard of on poker stars for a long, long time. Uh, it certainly feels like maybe their loyalty stuff is getting a bit better. Do you feel like maybe this renewed sense of competition and, and maybe this additional investment or this kind of bigger picture parent company investment is maybe making them a bit more generous to the customers, maybe creating a slightly nicer environment for us? Uh, I don't know if it's exactly that. I think they just know they've got to compete with GG throwing out different schedules every single month now. I'd also like to thank Stars a lot for the overlay in the, the 5 mil main. <laughs> the 1.3 1. mil got uh, shared quite a lot between the final table, so that was nice. Yeah, I, th- I think Jack nailed it there. I don't think it has anything to do with the, uh, the, 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 the corporate network above it. I think it just has to do with Stars had to respond to... Um, uh, the, the increased competition in, in particular from GG. Um, I mean, if you look at the history of stars and this is borne out in other industries I worked in, generally the companies that end up, the, the, that, that are the best for any niche industry are small companies without a large uh, owner because they're very much, you know, that that's their whole business. As soon as they get taken over by a large company, they become a small division in a larger company and that that usually results in a downgrading of service and that's ex- exactly what happened when stars got taken over by EMEA. now if, at the time they were able to get away with it because they had no real competition i think what we've the biggest factor we've seen is the emergence of actual genuine competition to them and they've had to respond to that and they are responding very well i mean i would give, give them credit for that i don't want to Hate, hate on stars relentlessly. I do think it, it's 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 a very welcome thing for the poker industry that stars seem to be willing to take overlays on the head. They're putting more effort into um, growing the industry as a whole, and um, also rumors that they're going to as soon as live poker comes back that they'll make more efforts in that area as well. Yes, Daryl alluding there to the the rumours that maybe a few people have heard that live poker at the grassroots level is on the horizon for them. And I imagine it will be immediately tough competition because when those uh, regional tours, Estrellas, UK IPT, uh, IPT type of stuff disappeared, it left a huge gap for other people to take on. Now, I wonder if the, the opposite will happen now. Obviously, start trying to get their footing back in the grassroots live poker scene. That will be additional competition for the Unibet Opens. Party Poker will have some more competition. Uh, GG certainly started dabbling with some live product in Europe uh, before lockdown. So again, yeah, we could be seeing um, a new player in town and at some level uh, at that sort of 1K and lower level. Um, the other little bit of a news story that's quite recent, actually only break a couple of days ago, is uh, one of the biggest names in the game and actually one of the kind of power players in the game at a lot of levels, Tony G, has just announced his resignation from the Lithuanian parliament. He did it by Twitter um, and he said he plans to now focus on business and potentially play more poker, maybe return to the business side of poker too. Of course, Tony was heavily involved in poker news, owned most of the shares in IBUS Media, I think back in the day, um, slowly and quietly sold them to Stars, as I recall, <laughs> and Stars slowly and quietly were happy to receive those without drawing too much attention to the fact that it was a little bit dodgy that they did have a stranglehold over poker media um, and, and didn't really declare it in the early days. That was actually a story we sort of half broke Dara. yeah remember we um we, we interviewed a member of poker news staff who was actually completely unaware of the fact that his company was essentially owned by poker stars and was shocked when he went back and found out that it was um so yeah it was i mean it's one of those things like poker doesn't really have a media uh in the sense of an independent press it's all trade press so uh we we, we kind of knew that anyway but it, but we still were under the impression that Poker News was funded by like all the sites rather than owned mostly by one site. Yeah, exactly. Well, kind of maybe expanding from that 
subject. Jack, do you read much of the poker media? As Dara said, it is more of a trade press. It's not a sort of a, a free press as, as such. Uh, but of course, there are individuals who are acting with more freedom and more maybe uh, editorial uh, authority of their own out there. Who would you read if you're reading any print media these days? Uh, well, when I'm on poker news, I'll read it if there is um, any of the super high roller stuff on. The coverage of that is always really good when they just play through hand by hand. And I've also got a couple of friends who actually write there. So I do check out their articles as well. But mostly I'm not consuming that much media. Fair Unless there's an article yeah. about me as well. I quite like those. Yeah, well, there's more and more articles about you these days and, and sure to be even more as your, uh, you know, domination of our game continues. You are one of the breakout sensations. How do you feel, actually? I think when you came on the show a year ago, we called you the breakout player of, uh, of, of Britain and I introduced you as the same this year. Breakout two years in a row, that's impressive. <laughs> was the first one really a breakout? Because the first one was just like binking a live 500 and that was nice, obviously. But I feel like this year is like the proper breakout one. Because I've had like by far the best year online. I had the best year online before that score even happened, as well as the final tabling, the 10k, which, believe it or not, was only a year ago. Well, before I get to some um, shilling to keep the lights on, could you maybe give us a little insight into the secrets of your success? Maybe the 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 ingredients and the recipe that have brought you so much success in the past nine, twelve months. Yeah, I've just got a really good group of friends, and we're always talking hands and even just non-poker stuff as well. We're sharing like stocks, tips and everything else, like talking about conversations that men don't usually have. Like we're all supporting each other in, in that sort of way as well. Like it's just a really good group of people. And that's where most of my learning's actually done these days. And also just run shit hot and that helps. Well, I have to pick up on that because you just said that sort of the conversation that men don't normally have. So is it fair to say that maybe you feel as though I don't know, a bunch of sensitive 20 somethings talking about all aspects of life and, and that helping their maybe overall game by helping their overall lives is, is a rare thing. I think it's quite rare. Yeah. I, I mean, like, thankfully most of my friends are pretty good with all that stuff anyway, because I don't really like to be friends with like proper, you know, like tough acting bloke kind of characters, but no, I think it does help a lot. Like if you've got your mental game set, well, then everything else is going to flourish as well. Daryl, we were before our time. I didn't realise this. That was our model like 10 years ago back when all those tough guys were about. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, we, we, we were definitely seen as the soft boys of Irish poker. Um... <laughs> also, are there any tough guys that you can think of who are like genuinely tough guys who are at the top level of poker? Because I can't think of any. It's definitely been the case that, that, that if you look at the, the way poker has moved over the past 10 years, it is, uh, I mean, we were... We, we, we had a variety of pejorative terms applied to our group when we come up. We were also referred to as the cowards. But I think when you look around the Irish poker scene now, you do see that the cowards inherited the earth um, ult, ult, ultimately. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, think, I think maybe that particular character type made more sense back in the old days where it was all live poker and nobody really knew what they were doing and just mindless aggression was, uh, was got, got you pretty far. But, um, but these days... Uh, you know, if you if you, that if 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 your strategy really doesn't get past, I'm just going to be mindlessly aggressive in every spot. You're not going to last very long. I like how you put that there, Dara. You know, obviously there was that dichotomy between the cowards and dreamers, and and I guess like ten years on, you say they inherited the earth. There's also maybe the case that the uh, the cowards survived. Most of the dreamers vanished, and the couple of dreamers that are left are now staked by the cowards. So that's sort of it. <laughs> indicative too perhaps um look i am gonna have to keep the lights on here we're gonna go back to unibet please don't insult unibet again jack for fuck's sake no, that wasn't insulting unibet that was insulting ian that's fine oh all right okay that's fine then obviously we're all about insulting ian we're i think yeah i think he's trying to undermine ian and suggest maybe that we need we, we, need, we need a new younger british ambassador just a swap, swap One was there too. <laughs> do you think would you look well with the shaved head i think you probably no i look like a giant egg i don't want that to happen <laughs> Well, that's part of our conditions of, of our Twitch stream team. But anyway, we, we, we'll, we'll work on that. We'll talk behind the scenes. Contract renewals are coming up. We'll, we'll have a word. We'll have a quiet word with the boss. See if we can oust Ian and get you in. Nice, uh, nice. Look, we, we have a really big series coming up here, and it's very much playing into Dara's ability to shill his book to become the face of 
um, our, our big series that's coming up. It is obviously a PKO series. It's going to run the last eight days of January, the 23rd to the 31st. Buy-ins ranging from €5 Euros to €200. Euros. But it's fair to say most of them are €25 Euro games, Jack. But there are some 50 quid and 100 games in there as well. We are very much catering to the mid-stakes clientele that we love so much. Um, but uh, I think... We also want to make sure that Simpson can afford to play most of them. <laughs> That's it, yeah. to dust roll off too. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. We haven't bashed Ian in ages. This is great. Back, <laughs> back, back to the core values of the show. Um, but anyway, I do want to give a, an opportunity maybe to you, Jack, to talk about PKOs. Darren and I have talked about it ad nauseum because he basically nudges me every third show and goes, we haven't mentioned them in three shows. Come on, get back to PKOs. But, uh, but I would like to get your fresh take on it. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably not going to say anything that hasn't been said before. I do prefer freeze outs, but what are you going to do when half the schedule is PKOs? You've just got to get on with it. And how do you feel like your learning curve in them has been? Maybe have, is, have you learned from maybe some uh, content that's out there, perhaps? Well, I used to think that the value of the starting bounty was completely wrong. So I was, I was punting it in everywhere. And then I realized it's actually not worth as many chips as I thought. So that's when I started to shift my game a little bit. But yeah, I, I don't know. Like they're, they're fine. They're okay. Like they're very good when you actually win them because you win all the money. But it, a lot of the money just gets spread out early on, and like there's not too much up top. Yeah, it is fair to say that it gets a bit spread out across the non-cashers, and then it gets kind of flat for a while, and then obviously at the very end, so, essentially it's a U curve. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's a weird wide U U curve, um, which can make the sort of middle portions seem not that important. Um, also, my results lifetime have just been way worse in PKOs compared to normal freeze-out tournaments as well. So uh, maybe I'm just a bit biased because of that. I'm probably just not playing them that well. But Well, Dara, before we get you to do your now becoming regular segment, uh, Dara's hot poker tip at the end of the show, maybe you could provide us with a poker tip on PKO final tables. I think that's one area where people maybe misunderstand the value of the bounty and maybe... They should be, I think, looking at those top pl pl places a bit more carefully and not thinking about maybe what look like chunky bounties. Uh, instead. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think probably what people misunderstand is that the 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 um, significance of the bounties gets gets a lot lot less as the tournament goes on and and ICM becomes much more significant. We we talked about the money payout as being sort of like a wide U, um, and. To be a very good um, winning PKO player, you don't really want to be coming in the middle too much. It's okay to bust out early a lot. It's also so long as you're 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 making the business end a lot of the time too, and you're winning bounties at least some of the time when you when you bust out. But early on, bounties bounties are obviously the main difference from strategy be between a PKO and a, and a regular MTT. But by the time you get to the final table, it's very unusual for the bounties to be a massive factor. Um, because the, the value of, of, of a bounty is really in relation to the number of starting stacks. And at the start of the tournament, everybody has one starting bounty and one starting stack. By the time you get to the final table, it, it's very unusual for the even the biggest bounty on the table to have, um, you know, they might have, they might have 10 starting bounties, but they might have 100 starting stacks. So um, it's really not that significant at all. People play the final table very badly because they over adjust for bounties and they under adjust for ICM. Um, if you, if you, if you just played it like a normal uh, final table and just ignore the bounties, you wouldn't be making much of a mistake at all. Um, it's usually just in very close spots that it makes a difference. Excellent stuff. Thank you very much for that. And I'm sure our audience will appreciate that, particularly the people who will be playing in the PKO uh, series coming up on Unibet uh, in just about seven days time, Sunday to Sunday. We get the two Sundays in there. Hopefully they'll be the really big days, the, the, the start day and the finish day. And uh, yeah, I imagine it will be a very successful series. Hopefully the first of many. Before we move on to your strategy tip, Dara, one final opportunity I want to give our guest this week. Jack Hardcastle, thank you so much for coming. It appears that you've come to us from, it looks like maybe the corner of a church. So, uh, uh, Yeah, well, it is actually the old church uh, building. Yeah, I've got the stained glass in the, in the building. Beautiful. beautiful. I, I, I still have my curtains. You would think that I'd be living in a church, but that's what's happening. <laughs> well I, i'm coming from my newly oriented box room which uh, features these curtains which are becoming quite the sensation on the upswing stream the lads really really think these curtains should go what do you reckon yeah burn them burn them just, just burn them yeah i'm not, yeah, sure. I'm not sure they could they could be burned they look remarkable <laughs> i'm like the whole house would go up Jeez. is it a nuclear shelter or something you're in a nuclear bunker it looks yeah 
It's very yeah. um, 60s Soviet style. Yeah, I gotta I gotta maybe ask my landlord to uh, to uh, change those curtains. What was it? Oscar Wilde said, "Either those curtains go, or I do." Famous last words. Famous um, last words, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, Dara. On that note, give us your strategy tip. I think it's going to be a slight follow up from the "Let There Be Ranges" style tip you gave us last time out. Yeah, you completely deflated my last one by pointing it out. It was just basically "Let There Be Ranges" uh, condensed into in, into a few sentences. We, we, the point was last time was that your decision to bet post flop on any street depends on your range rather than your hand. That's also true for the size of bet that you should use. Um, and the crucial factor is, is how strong your really strong hands are. Let's, for example, if you raise under the gun um, and only the big blind defends and the flop comes ace, king, nine, well, you can have aces, you can have kings, you can have nines, you can have ace, king. He possibly doesn't have any of those hands. He might not three bet nines, but he's certainly three betting all the other hands. So once he hasn't three bet preflop, he doesn't have those hands. So you have all the really strong hands now, which means when you go ahead and bet, um, you, 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 you can use a really large size. On the other hand, if the board comes three low cards, uh, you know, you might not have any sets um, if, if there are cards lower than the pairs you would open uh, from under the gun. He he can still have all the sets. You have the over pairs, so you still have a range advantage. You have more strong hands, but your hands aren't super strong. They're just one pair of hands. So, so typically on those type of boards, you're going to go smaller. Great advice. Well, I, I think maybe our audience, you said a lot of them were happy with the show, but felt it could be improved by these strategy tips. I'm, I'm certainly learning something from them myself, and I appreciate you putting it like that, Dara, and I appreciate the addition of this to the show. It has been absolutely fantastic having Jack Hardcastle poker supremo on the show this week i gotta say you didn't fire as many shots as i expected but at least no, the- that, that got taken out of context i think we didn't give him a, i think we didn't give him enough chance um maybe he wants to fire <laughs> it's off. not too late i don't know who, who did who did i get really it's mainly just ian <laughs> so. yeah, yeah exactly you only got ian so just like right as the like closing credits are coming down now just scream out all the people you hate and why you hate them um maybe i have one last question which might give jack a chance to do this obviously jack's had uh, two amazing years, actually. Uh, we, we we referred to his first year as a breakout. Maybe, maybe it wasn't. There's a bit of a danger. He's, if you remember, David Tom Kitt used to win Best Newcomer at, at the <laughs> Irish Poker Awards every year. Like when you win him for the fifth time, it starts to become a bit of a joke. But given the year you've had, Jack, and I know you're very strongly motivated by um, your support group, and they're all very happy for for, um, for you when you win. But I also know from talking to you almost every day, as we do, that you're all, you also derive a certain amount of motivation from proving your critics wrong uh, or proving... Is, is How big a factor is that to you? I, I think it used to be a lot bigger than it is now because, uh, like, I don't need to prove anything now, really. Like, that's all done. Um, I don't know. I'm just waiting, really, for sort of live tournaments and stuff to come back. I'm sure there'll be a renewal of that when, once they come about, but... Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, currently, my motivation is actually not that poker related. Like, I'm just trying to sort out like health and fitness stuff first, planning travel once COVID stuff passes. Um, I'm not really grinding every day. I, I'm playing Sundays and stuff still, but not not huge sessions. And in terms of these critics, like, first of all, who who are they? You don't necessarily have to name their names, but like, what type of person decides that they don't like the cut of jacks? Uh... Yeah, um, pretty salty bad regs generally. <laughs> Salty bad regs. God, it could be anybody, really. Could. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to go to. We're trying. We're trying, Dara. You're, but you're, you're giving it a good try here to get some names out of him. He was, he was, <laughs> I'm, I'm not just going to come on and start just bang banging every single person <laughs> in the UK poker. <laughs> okay, well, just we're chatting we're, in our chat group before the show, Dara. He was full of chat about all these people he was going to name and shame, but now what's happening? Yeah. I, I, I mean, one thing, obviously, we, we do try and focus on the positive in the show, but there is a lot of negativity around poker as well. Uh, like, what type of negative criticism, let's say, have you uh, have you had to endure? Oh, there was a really funny one. Um, from So just after I'd won the WPT 500, I went out to Bali with a few friends on holiday. And when we were there, WPT Cambodia was on. So we thought, okay, we'll hop across. Like, two of us went, no, two other people came across with me to Cambodia. And I try to sell for a $2,700 high roller. But you can only imagine the state of the, the games out there. It was pretty good. And um, I tried to sell it. Well, I did sell it, but I put a post up saying I'm selling at 1.15 for this. And I posted my graph. But at that point, sort of online high stakes, I'd mostly just been taking a beating. So I just showed like my 0 to 99 like um, lifetime. Obviously, like printing like a reasonable amount per game for that stake. 
And then there was like a lot of, oh yeah, you removed your high stakes result. This is why, blah, blah, blah. And then there was like a lot of uh, chat in the comments about it. And this is, I think, probably how petty I am. I went back about um, two days after I'd won that 270K and just put this aged well. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's, that's, that's beautiful. Well, look, I, all, I, all I can say is the fact that you haven't named anybody maybe shows that contrary to what I th said earlier, maybe there is some ambassador qualities in there you know and to uh to put yeah yeah i'm playing the politics of it right now i think <laughs> look we really appreciate having you on the show thank you so much for being our guest on the lock-in jack hardcastle thank you for having me thanks jack bop bop